Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Jeffords, an orthopedic spine surgeon and co-medical director of Resurgeon Spine Center in Atlanta, Georgia. If you are someone who is suffering from chronic lower back pain, you may be one of the thousands of people who suffer from degenerative disc disease of the lumbar spine. Degeneration of the discs in our spine is a normal aging process, and in most cases, disc degeneration does not cause significant symptoms. However, for some people, a degenerated disc can cause long-term debilitating back pain. When this occurs, we call this syndrome lumbar degenerative disc disease, or DDD. What I would like to do in this video is to explain what a degenerated disc is, review the treatment options for degenerative disc disease, and answer many of the commonly asked questions about degenerated lumbar discs. In order to understand what degenerative disc disease is, it helps to begin with an understanding of the anatomy of your lower back. The spinal column consists of 33 bones called vertebra that are stacked one on top of the other, like building blocks. In the lumbar spine, there are five of these vertebra, labeled L1 through L5. The L5 is at the bottom and sits above the sacrum, or tailbone. In between each of these vertebra, there are spinal discs, which serve as cushions or shock absorbers for the spine. The disc between L4 and L5 is called the L4-5 disc. The bottom disc is called the L5-S1 disc. Behind the column of bone and disc is the spinal canal, which is formed by a series of bony arches called lamina that are each attached to their corresponding vertebra by columns of bone called pedicles. Each arch sequentially hooks onto the one below on either side, slightly behind and to the sides of the spinal canal. Where these arches hook together, they form a pair of joints called facet joints. Running through the spinal canal is the spinal cord, which runs down from the brain and comes all the way down and stops at the first lumbar vertebra. Below L1, there is no longer a spinal cord, only nerves that have branched off the spinal cord. Sometimes these spinal nerves are called nerve roots because they look like roots branching off of a tree trunk. These nerves travel down through the remainder of the spinal canal contained within a sac of spinal fluid. At each disc level, a pair of these spinal nerves, one on each side, exits from the spinal canal and radiates down the legs to supply the muscles, joints, and skin throughout the legs and feet. The spinal nerves exit from the spinal canal through tunnels called foramen that are bordered by the disc in front and the facet joints in the back. Because these nerves radiate all the way down to the feet, irritation or pinching of these spinal nerves can result in radiating leg pain or numbness. These leg symptoms are technically known as radiculopathy, but many people call these symptoms sciatica. Radiculopathy can be caused by several conditions, including stenosis, which is narrowing of the spinal canal, disc degeneration, and disc herniations. To understand disc degeneration, we need to take a closer look at the structure of the disc. Each spinal disc consists of two parts, a firm outer wall called the annulus, which is like a tough ligament made of fibers woven together, and a softer inner portion called the nucleus, which is like a firm gel. The nucleus is made of proteins and other materials that naturally hold water, which keeps the nucleus well hydrated and allows it to function as a good shock absorber. The outer one-third of the annulus is innervated by a fine network of very small nerves. These nerves are much smaller than the spinal nerves that radiate out from the spinal canal and run down the legs. Chemical or mechanical irritation of these small nerves in the outer annulus may result in back pain. This is what is thought to cause the back pain that can be associated with disc degeneration. As we age, our discs will slowly begin to degenerate or wear out. This process usually begins in our 30s and is part of the normal aging process, just like our hair turning gray. This process happens in all of us, but in some people it may progress at a faster rate or start at an earlier age. This is mostly determined by genetics, but other factors can affect the rate of disc degeneration as well. Smoking disrupts the blood supply to the discs and can cause premature aging and degeneration of the discs. Certain injuries of the disc, obesity, and repetitive manual activities such as heavy lifting may also cause the discs to degenerate prematurely. With normal aging, the proteins and other materials within the inner gel or nucleus start to break down and lose their ability to hold water. As this occurs, the nucleus starts to dry out and slowly shrinks and the disc will slowly flatten. On an x-ray, this will show up as narrowing of the disc space between the vertebra. On an MRI scan, the normally white-appearing disc will slowly darken, 
eventually turning black as it degenerates and loses water. During this process, the nucleus loses its elasticity and ability to absorb shock. As this happens, the outer annulus has to absorb more of the stress. Small tears or fissures in the disc's outer annulus may develop and can slowly enlarge over time. The annulus becomes weaker and pressure from the inner nucleus may start to cause the annulus to bulge. The discs sometimes bulge to the point where they impinge on the spinal nerves exiting from the spinal canal behind the disc, resulting in radiating leg pain or what is called radiculopathy. The disc bulging and tears in the annulus can also be seen on an MRI scan. Sometimes the tears are called high intensity zones on an MRI report. These tears and the bulging of the annular wall can cause mechanical irritation of the nerves that supply the annulus, resulting in mechanical back pain. Also, chemicals within the nucleus can leak out to the outer part of the annulus through the tears. These chemicals can cause irritation and inflammation of the nerves that supply the outer part of the annulus, also resulting in pain. The inflammation and pain associated with a degenerated disc can also cause the muscles and ligaments that lie on top of the spine to become inflamed, and as a result, the muscles and ligaments can begin to tighten and spasm, leading to additional symptoms. The pain associated with degenerative disc disease is usually felt as low back pain that often radiates into the buttocks and upper thighs. As the degeneration progresses, the disc continues to flatten and provides less and less shock absorption. The stress is transferred to the bony end plates of the vertebra above and below the disc. As the bony end plates see more stress, they react by forming hard, dense bone to absorb that stress. This dense bone shows up as thick white bone on an x-ray and is called sclerosis. The stresses on the bone can also result in bone spur formation. Sometimes the bone spurs can press on the spinal nerves in addition to the bulging disc, causing additional leg pain. Before going into the treatment options for lumbar degenerative disc disease, it is important to understand what happens if you do nothing. Physicians call what happens when you do nothing the natural history. It is critical to realize that many people with no back pain at all are walking around with degenerated discs, and that not all degenerated discs cause symptoms. If you are experiencing back pain and your x-rays or MRI scans show a degenerated disc, it may be tempting to conclude that the degenerated disc is causing the pain, but this may not be the case. When you do experience back pain from a degenerated disc, in many cases it is a temporary flare-up, and the symptoms can resolve on their own without specific treatment. In some cases, the back pain may come back, sometimes triggered by an event or an injury, such as lifting something the wrong way. Fortunately, for most people, these recurrences of back pain are short-lived and few and far between. For other patients, the back pain episodes can be more frequent, more severe, and more long-term. And in some cases, the pain can become constant and chronic, lasting for more than six weeks at a time. Unfortunately, it is impossible to tell by X-ray or MRI findings which of these categories you will fall into but the overwhelming majority of people with disc degeneration do not experience long-term debilitating back pain. Despite the fact that back pain from a degenerated disc can resolve spontaneously, this does not mean that the disc has repaired itself or regenerated. Your x-rays and MRI scans will probably look no different after you have recovered from an episode of back pain from disc degeneration as they did during the episode. Unfortunately, our discs have little to no ability to regenerate due to their very poor blood supply. When it comes to our discs, once the damage is done, it's done. But again, this does not necessarily mean that you are doomed to a lifetime of back pain once the discs begin to degenerate. Treatment for degenerative disc disease can generally be broken into three separate phases of treatment. Phase one includes non-invasive treatments, phase two includes spinal injections, and phase three is surgery, which is rarely needed. Remember that the discs do not have the ability to regenerate and therefore treatments are not aimed at repairing the disc but instead at reducing symptoms. The goals of treatment for each phase should be to relieve pain and improve function. Phase one of treatment consists of non-invasive options. Prior to initiating this phase of treatment, your physician will likely have some idea of what may be causing the pain based on your history, examination, and x-rays. The cornerstone of this phase of treatment is regular exercise for core and back strengthening and flexibility. Strengthening your core and lower back muscles allows them to provide more support for the spine and discs, decreasing the stress on the discs. Stretching exercises improve the flexibility of the muscles and ligaments, decreasing the incidence of muscle strain and spasm. 
This exercise program will often be guided by a trained physical therapist to ensure that you are doing the right exercises for your condition and performing the exercises correctly. In addition to an exercise program, pain relief can be achieved with oral medications, including steroids, which are powerful anti-inflammatories, non-steroid anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen, and pain relievers such as Tylenol. Occasionally, stronger medications, such as muscle relaxants and narcotic painkillers, are prescribed for short-term flare-ups of severe pain. Local ice and heat can also be effective. Phase one of treatment should last for at least six to four weeks before proceeding to the next step. At this point, an MRI scan is usually ordered if one has not been done previously. The MRI scan is done to rule out more serious conditions, such as an infection or tumor, and to try to more accurately identify the source of pain. Phase two of treatment for degenerative disc disease is lumbar epidural steroid injections. These are outpatient procedures where steroid medicine is injected into the spinal canal using x-ray guidance. The steroid medicine does not repair or regenerate the disc, but instead blocks the inflammatory response, hopefully allowing the symptoms to resolve. Epidural steroid injections are more effective for relieving radiating leg pain from a pinched nerve, but patients may experience relief of back pain as well. Sometimes more than one injection is needed, and a series of two or three injections, given over a six to 12 week period, may be required. The injections may be performed by a spine surgeon, but are more commonly performed by non-surgical spine specialists called physiatrists, or by anesthesia pain specialists. Phase three of treatment for lumbar degenerative disc disease is surgery. The overwhelming majority of patients with degenerative disc disease do not need surgery, even if their back pain has become chronic. In most cases, regular exercise, modification of activities, and use of anti-inflammatories, ice, and heat are enough to keep the back pain under good control. Severe flare-ups can often be controlled with injections. When the back pain from degenerative disc disease becomes severe, chronic, and disabling, and six months of the non-surgical treatments have failed to bring the pain to a manageable level, surgery may be considered. Before you make the decision to have surgery for chronic back pain, you should realize several important points. The first is that the success of surgery hinges on being able to accurately identify the source of the back pain, which can be very difficult to do. If you are experiencing back pain and your x-rays or MRI scans show a degenerated disc, it is tempting to conclude that the degenerated disc is causing the pain, but this may not be the case. Remember that there are a lot of people with degenerated discs that are not having back pain. There is a diagnostic test called a discogram that is sometimes used to help identify the disc in question as the true source of pain, but this test is controversial and may not be 100% accurate. Even if your surgeon has, to the best of his ability, identified the disc as the source of pain and is correct, you still may not benefit from surgery and may continue to experience back pain even if the surgery goes well. Despite these pitfalls, there are many patients who have benefited greatly from surgery and have experienced significant improvement in their back pain and overall function. There are two surgical options for treating a painful degenerated disc, fusion and artificial disc replacement. Fusion involves removing the painful degenerated disc and replacing it with a bone graft or fusion cage that allows the bones above and below the disc space to fuse together, forming a single immobile unit. There are various surgical techniques for achieving a fusion. One option is to approach the disc from the front, through the abdomen. This technique is called anterior lumbar interbody fusion, or ALIF. Some surgeons prefer to approach the disc from the side, a technique called lateral lumbar interbody fusion, or LLIF. Finally, the spine can be approached directly from the back using what is called a posterior approach. Spinal fusion using a posterior approach can now be done using a minimally invasive technique called MIST lift. Minimally invasive techniques can provide the advantages of smaller incisions, less muscle tissue damage, and a quicker recovery. A newer alternative to fusion is artificial disc replacement surgery, which is done through an anterior approach using an incision in the lower abdomen. The degenerated disc is removed and replaced with a device that maintains the disc space height, stabilizes the disc, and maintains the motion of the disc. There are advantages and disadvantages to each of these surgical techniques, and just because you may be a candidate for one technique does not mean that you are necessarily a candidate for one of the other techniques. In summary, lumbar disc degeneration is part of the natural aging process, 
in many cases causes minimal or temporary symptoms and oftentimes does not need specific treatment. In cases where disc degeneration causes significant back pain, medications and therapy are usually effective. Epidural steroid injections are sometimes needed, and only in a very small percentage of patients, surgery is required. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. You may have additional questions, and if so, you may want to consult with your spine physician.